Boardroom Bound, Episode 82, How to Create Value Through Commitment, with Craig Hovda. As I've gone into board uh, positions, is you know, why do they want me there? And so, um, even though I have a lot of, I think, a lot of value to add, others might not, in a lot of different areas, right? Um, I try to focus on those areas where they are looking for me to lead or have the expertise. Hello, and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry, and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Craig Hovda. Craig had a nearly 20-year career at Deloitte, one of the leading professional services firms in the world, built himself a very successful career as a principal, and in parallel with that, got an opportunity to be a non-management board member for one of their technology subsidiaries. And that experience opened up some doors for him to understand a lot more about what to do on that side of the fence. And we also talk about some of his experience in the nonprofit world and how that comes together, bridging his experience being a leading thinker in the executive management side over into the boardroom space. And I'm really excited to share all this with you today. Let's jump into the show. Craig Hovda, welcome to the Boardroom Bound Podcast. Thank you, Alexander. Great to be here. And here is actually here today. This is a lot of fun for me. We don't tend to be in the studio too often. Uh, it's really interesting to be able to just look with someone, talk through their stories, and sit and have that conversation in person together. So this will be great fun today. And the way I, I love to start out audi- for our audience is to think about, we know that you are an expert today in what you do. And, and that is very typical for someone in the boardroom, but you didn't become an expert right away. You had to grow into that position. You probably had some different experiences and some experiments. Maybe we can just start by talking about your story. Where did you begin before you ended up where you are today? Sure, Alexander. Yeah, so where did I start? Um, about 30-some years of technology. And technology for me really started in sales uh, and then migrated into leadership uh, and the corporate corporate. Uh, realm. So that went from three, I called it three letter companies, right? Started at IBM, uh, went to another company called EDS, which was Ross Perot's company, which is now part of HP, uh, and then went to a a private partnership uh, with a big four consulting firm at the time. So that was kind of how I got started um, and where I grew up. And for me, it's always important to know know, where someone grew up. So it was really technology um, way back from green screen mainframes, if you can believe that, Mm -hmm. from my age to uh, at the end of my career now, it's, you know, it's business transformation, digital transformation, whatever buzzword you want to use. And it, it's interesting when you think about sort of a brand and a reputation, because for some reason, uh, those those pop sort of, if you look at a resume, the sort of names that we're seeing here from the Deloitte's, the IBM's and others, some people just put a cachet against that. And that's a part of it, right? Because it, if you're thinking about you want to be in a board, that's a beginning of what someone sees about you. Those are good things. They're clearly not the end all and be all. When we think about people in our audience who are considering, I would like to be on a board someday, part of what you have to have are the stories, the experiences, but it doesn't hurt to have the good names on your resume. What are your thoughts about that as someone who's been on multiple boards when you're looking for other people? Because before you get to know them, you're looking at something. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, the background's important. Obviously, the the logo it, it can lend a lot of credibility, but it's more important, really. What did you actually do for those firms or those companies? Because if you look at those entities that I've worked for, there was you know thousands of, of people just like me sure. that held similar roles over the years that I was there. So it's more important to the stories, what you did, how you did it, what you accomplished, what you learned, the difficult situations you dealt with, uh, and then the most important thing I think, Alexander, is how then you can translate that to a new uh, and different situation, especially if you're moving from a management position to a position of governance. Mm -hmm. Which is a tough transition for a lot of people. So let's talk about that. Maybe you can explain to us how that first board role came about and we'll talk about that change. Because for some people, that light bulb doesn't come on very easily. Right, and that's actually where it happened for me. I was was fortunate enough to work um, for our firm uh, in Japan, help them uh, 
build a business, acquire a business, and then uh, was uh, one of the only two non-Japanese individuals on the board, which is pretty uncommon um, from what I understand at the time. So, and, and going from the person who was kind of calling the shots on the acquisition and the business development and the practice development to actually then having to govern in a um, culture that is very was foreign to me was very, very interesting. The speed with which I thought things should get done uh, versus the way the speed with which they got done in Japan was like completely like directly opposed. So it was really, really very interesting for me. Um, and that was about, a, for me, it was about a, a two year journey. Um, at the time for the last year, I was actually just traveling to Japan for about a two hour meeting. Um, and, it's a long uh, flight for two hours. Right. I say it's a 14 hour commute for two hours. I mean, it was an awfully long way to go. So, but it, but the cultural aspect of it was amazing. Um, making changes that needed to be made, which was, was very, very difficult. And taking the management hat off and moving it to governing um, was a, a good exercise for me. Now, there's a, there's a couple of parts of this I'd like to dive into. One is we talk about diversity in the boardroom is so essential, and that's mm-hmm. a lot of different things. It's easy to see gender in a photo or skin color. I would say socioeconomic history, mm-hmm. your international experience, things like that. I would love to dive into this for yourself, and maybe we'll compare it when I was on my first UK board and I was the only American in the room. Different cultures, uh, different personalities, lots of opportunities to learn and grow, but very hard. So you're giving 14 hours for a two-hour meeting. There's a lot of key things you need to get across in that meeting. Any board needs to coalesce very quickly. You need to figure out how you make the right decisions at the right time. Can you talk us through what that learning curve looked like? Because while it might not be as hard for most people joining their first board, you had to figure out a lot of stuff in a very different type of culture. Now, culture could be type of environment. You may have gone from a very collaborative company to one that's much more aggressive and uh, people sort of fighting for airtime. So there's different ways to think about it. But this would be a good example that I think we can all wrap our heads around. Yeah. So I think for me... um I had gone through the acculturation process working in Japan for about a 12 month period before I joined the board. And that was key, I think, to my success. If not understanding um, that what a high, high, high means, it doesn't mean yes, it means I hear you. (laughs) Uh, Also understanding that um, when I left to go back to the United States for a while and left a laundry list of things to be done, and I came back and no work had been done, understanding that they were waiting for me to see if I came back, right? And um, so one of the executives uh, I worked with in Japan at the end of my tenure there said, uh, they called me uh, the gajin that came back in Japanese, which I cannot pronounce, but it was, I was the, the guy that, that came back, that continued mm-hmm. to come back. So it was perseverance, understanding the cultural nuances as I observe them every day in the business and social situations culturally. And then um, understanding how influence had to be used um, so that I could actually have things accomplished that needed to get accomplished. And and it was a very collaborative situation. Um, And fortunately for me, uh, my firm is highly collaborative, so I understood that. It's just a matter of uh, understanding how through collaboration and patience, I can make the right things happen from a board perspective. And let's talk about the influence. This is a very good example for all of us because you've already touched on the point. You go from being someone who is a doer and you probably get promoted by being a doer and being successful to suddenly someone who's coaching and guiding, helping with strategy, using influence influence to be successful. Uh, I've heard someone on a previous guest described, I know what the right answer is, but I can't tell them the answer. I would, I'd like to lead them to what I think the right answer is so they can make the right decision. Talk us about that and influence and how that actually works in a boardroom. Yeah. So, um, that has been very interesting for me, uh, even recently, not just back when this in Japan, which is, um, actually observing, uh, your other board members who, uh, maybe aren't as nuanced in, uh, not trying to direct, right? A, a manager role versus a governance role. Um, and it's, for me, it's always about asking the right questions, right? Um, and knowing that if you ask the right questions, the answers will lead management to a decision that is probably closely aligned to where you think they should go. Um, you know, and what does that mean from a strategy perspective versus maybe an operational perspective? Because, uh, you know, in the governance realm, it's more about, are they headed in the right direction with the right, um, things that can be measured so that you can understand and they can understand, are they operationally headed in the right way and, and is success being achieved or not? So it's asking those right questions that then will direct 
they'll di- kind of direct themselves to where you think they should go. And is it, again, can you measure the outcome of that? I like the way you've described it, but I want to paint the scene for our audience. So imagine you're on your, your first major board role opportunity and you're in a room full of very smart people, all of who have good value to add, good questions to ask. You don't get to sit there and ask a ton of questions over the course of the day. Someone right. likened it to me of you're playing a game of baseball. Baseball, you get up to bat three, maybe four times in the game on average. Those are the amount of really good questions you get to ask over the course of the day. Now, clearly, you've probably had your thousand pages of reading that you've done before the right. meeting. You've done some deep thoughts with a towel in your head trying to figure out, okay, what do I need to know and how do I get through it? But you don't get to ask all the stuff you want. You don't get the detail because you're not in it every day like the management team is. How do you figure out how to bring them forward? Yeah, that's a good question. So so for me, it's about, um, it gets back to, I think, the, like so the expertise. What is my expertise? And then and as I've gone into board uh, positions is, you know, why do they want me there? And so, um, even though I have a lot of, I think a lot of value to add, others might not, in a lot of different areas, right? Um, I try to focus on those areas where they are looking for me to lead or have the expertise. Um, so, and that does take some patience and some maturing in the boardroom, right? Um, to understand that um, there are certain places where I can play and have influence and others where I can just observe. And then also there's the opportunity to influence um, around the board meeting uh, with your fellow board members, giving insights and thoughts to those who might be looked at to lead in those areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's where I found that you can be effective as well in those other areas where the in the boardroom you might not be able to lead, but you can help you know, lead in coalescing outside the, out of the boardroom with your bo- fellow board members. And that's a great point. I'd love to expand upon that because let's say a typical board, maybe you meet quarterly in person. You might have committee work in between, depending on how many committees you're on, how much time you're engaging with. Could you give us a sense uh, how much time do you spend sort of maybe in some of those individual conversations, which are things where you're touching them. Sometimes it might be email, might be a phone right. call. How do you spend the right amount of time? Because everyone who's doing board roles in addition to what they're doing is already pretty busy. A board might be, say, 300 hours a year. So there's a lot going on. How, right. do, you, how do you figure out how to best spend that? Yeah. So um, with me, it's all about the personal relationships and trying to develop them with the, my fellow board members. Uh, and then through those personal relationships, trying to find those things we have in common that we can connect on. And then that's what I I will use then to develop the relationship outside of the board, uh, whether it might be a personal phone call, uh, you know, email, text, whatever it might be. Uh, and through that further developing the pers- of the personal relationship, um, when I d- am face to face or uh, take an opportunity to do like a, a, a Zoom or a chat with somebody, a uh, video conference, uh, just like anybody else, you find you can have more influence uh, in an area where you think you want to um, that you might not normally. So it's just about building the personal relationship. The way that I tend to think about it, it's sort of you've gone from um, fingers on the pulse to noses and fingers out when you get up in the boardroom. That can be really hard for some people. Did you have any sort of learning curve or tough experience Absolutely. maybe in your first meeting where it, this doesn't seem like how I thought it would be? Well, yeah, I think that in, in the both for-profit and non-profit, it was all about um, it, early on realizing that I, I knew exactly what needed to be done, right? And I was going to, being the arrogant person that I am, right, say... You know, I think we need to do this or why, why aren't we, you know, contemplating that, uh, observing the reaction uh, and then understanding that, you know, I need to probably take things a little, a little more, more slowly. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that was really it for me, both in profit and nonprofit. Um, and, um, you know, we all we can all learn and grow no matter how where we are in our careers. And uh, thankfully, I'm, I, I still think I can do that. But, yeah. Well, let's transition to describing some of the pros and cons between the two different opportunities because our audience is, I'm not sure exactly what this is between for-profit and non-profit mm-hmm. boards either seeking now and, and they might transition the other later on. Different vibes, different right. experiences. So the first one for you was working on a for-profit board. Now you're in a non-profit board. Can you give us a sense of, of the values you're seeing from those different ones in terms of your personal growth and development and how you're approaching those? Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting is the mission, right? The mission for the organization organizations was is really diametrically opposed. One is it was all about making sure the stockholders were getting what they needed. The, the growth was there, the profitability was there, right? It was really, really clear about the you know the market trajectory we needed to have based upon the investments we'd made. Versus um, and then, and also the you know the way the team was organized around getting that done. Um, so the mission going from a a, a country based uh, technology firm to a global mission um, that is. Uh, 
very focused on doing something uh, globally in a lot of regards with uh, with volunteers. Uh, very very different di- uh, dynamics, and then. Um, uh, working within the board, uh, where you have mostly uh, business people, right, and not nonprofit um, individuals, uh, being able to take off their kind of business hat, uh, but still keep the uh, intellectual knowledge and curiosity that they have that will be valuable in the nonprofit, uh, but then truly understand what the mission is and be on. Uh, like on track and in touch with that mission um, it is interesting. I mean, it's, it's a, it is a challenge. Um, and it is, I think it's a hard one. It was a, once again, a kind of a hard transition for me up front. You know, say some things you shouldn't have said, right? You que- ask questions that maybe you shouldn't have asked. Um, so, well, we both come from a business perspective. And so it's easy for us to walk into a, even a leading nonprofit and assume they will have all of the sort of background expertise, process systems in place. Right. Um, certainly not fair if you're starting on a smaller nonprofit, but even some of the largest organizations, think about the board that they're going to have. So what you would expect at, say, like a J.P. Morgan was before is very different from the type of composition you see in a nonprofit. Some are there because they might be some of their best fundraisers. Some are there for deep subject matter expertise. Some because they were, say, the lead volunteers that grew into the opportunity and developing. That also calls for different sort of influences we were talking about right. before and the type of experience experience you'd have as a board member. Maybe you can speak to that. Yeah. So, um, the, um, it, you know, cause it's interesting to me that as I, as I look at, um, who was on the board when I joined, right? And now, um, as we have a, a new CEO and we're looking to, uh, probably over the next six years, uh, to kind of reformulate our board, um, to see and to formulate with the board, other board members, what it is we're looking, you know, what we, we think we'd like to have, the diversity we'd like to have, the skill sets we'd like to have, um, and experiences we'd like to have. And, um, you know, it's, it, and if you look at the way the board is comp- compromised now, it's like you, you articulated is how did they grow up and then what do we want to be? That transition is um, one that needs to be thoughtful and deliberative. Uh, the board needs to be on bo- board with that because what it means is, you know, it's going to probably change dramatically and the board members need to understand and support that process. Um, so it's really a, a very interesting challenge um, to take on. But it, as you look at um, the way most nonprofit boards ha- have grown up, it hasn't been thoughtful and deliberative, right? It has been those things. So if you think about if we were to be thoughtful and deliberate, much like a for-profit board, how would we get that done? And understanding the dynamics around that I think is really important. It's interesting to me because you have very different types of situations between a for-profit and a non-profit, but some things should be the same. So someone would say, only take a board role that you are passionate about. And we can all envision that for a non-profit. And everyone has their own individual values. It might be homelessness. It might be water. It could be any sorts of things. Um, And it's easy to say, yes, this is something I'm excited about and I can get behind it because wherever you're doing something, you're, you're giving a lot of time and energy into it, and you will bring your best self if you're passionate about it. I think some people might have a harder time envisioning, how do I find the roles that I'm passionate about in a for-profit world where, just like you talked about, they're making money for shareholders might be their primary goal. I imagine for anybody, you do not want uh, the money, the, the compensation you'll be getting to be the driver. That, that's probably not going to be the end result. Do you have any thoughts on how someone finds something they're passionate about if they want to have a paid board role? How do they, how do they figure out, even if that's not the driver, like, how do I find the right thing to invest my time and energy into. Right. Well, I think it has to come down to um, evaluating, like for me, like I helped start and grow that business, right? Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be on the board. So for me, I had a... um, uh, you know, a natural inclination to go do that. Uh, it's all about you know what do you enjoy about what you're doing in your job. What what is your expertise uh, that you're that you have currently? Um, how do you think you can actually help uh, somebody uh, through a governance role versus a manager role direct um, and then and then measure success in that board? Uh, I think that's that's really important. I think where I've seen some of my friends maybe. Um, get into trouble, it might have been more about the logo uh, or the money for that board than actually taking what they've been successful at and know they've been successful at and, and deploying it in that opportunity. Uh, the board's for the board's sake versus, you know, being wanting to be on the board to actually help that, that business grow and succeed. Right. And so let's also approach it from another way. So 
I would advise all of the listeners that you need to develop a platform of authority. That's what makes you sought after. That's how you add the best value to a board. You are a deep subject matter expert. And clearly, technology transformation is probably the one of the things people would know about for you, Craig. This is why he would add tremendous value to the board. We don't have that. If someone is thinking about how do I position myself for a board? Because a board might also say, we would take that person on the board of advisors. Like that's a consultant that we need for a period mm-hmm. of time versus this is sort of a permanent seat that we want. Right. Because if you join a board, they don't want you for a year. They're hopefully looking for say nine years. Let's say that on average. How do you tend to think about that? If you're a sitting board member about where do we rent versus buy? Right. Well, I think um, it's kind of a stepping stone, right? I think I would I would say if I'm looking to, to you know, as I was looking to do things, it's I think you have to start as the advisor, right? Get the experience. Um, and it's just like, I think most things, and get the network, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, get to be known as that expert. Um, and then as I was stating earlier, as people get to know you as that expert, they'll also get to know you and, and how you are as a, a, a more comprehensive individual and how you can weigh in your judgment, um, how you approach uh, problem solving, uh, the insights you have, uh, and your ability to really um, operate in a manner which would be more of a governance model than an, actually an advisor model. So I think it's it's figuring out what the stepping stones are, uh, how to get your you know kind of yourself started in the advising roles, and then migrating through that and networking into the to, to more you know a, a board member. And I imagine a key part of it is the networking, of course, is essential. But let's say your network has been successful in opening up opportunities for you. You would ideally only step into a role that's going to be successful for both sides. I liken it to dating. Both mm-hmm. sides should really right. be happy about the marriage that's going to happen. Do you have any thoughts about doing due diligence to figure out this is what's been successful for me to know that this would be a good opportunity that I should sign up for? Yeah. So a couple of things around that. One, one what's really important to, for me has been what are they asking me to do? What, to do? what do they want from me? Um, what do they perceive that I can do and add value? Um, I like to ask the CEO um, to give me like the five things uh, that he or she thinks that I can add uh, to the process and the chairman as well. Um, because for me, it's important to um, uh, to understand that. And I, I, and I do want it in writing. So, I'm, you know, kind of is articulated. Um, because what I've found sometimes is uh, there can be a misperception around um, that I'm a deep technologist. I'm not a deep technologist, right? If you're looking to me to be a deep technologist, I'm not the guy, the person that's going to do that for you, right? Um, also, our own expectations of what, uh, especially if you're looking at nonprofit, what kinds of things you would like my assistance in, right? Um, I'm, I am not the person that's going to go out and, and cold call for development, but I'll go with you to see anybody because I'm, I'm, if I'm, you know, a big believer in the mission. Mm-hmm. So it's those things, it's not, not just what my expertise, but what are the things you might want out of me? Um, I've helped in a couple of strategy developments, right? Uh, from all the way from the beginning to review, uh, helping facilitate the approval of those, those strategies. I love to do that, right? If you want to, if somebody wants to get my interest peaked, if everything else, I'm checking all the other boxes, that might, might get me over the edge to say, yeah, I'll, I will commit to spend the time. Um, so, it's, it's, it, but it is a due diligence process, right? And I like to make sure it's really clear because the last thing you want to do is uh, accept the, the position, getting involved with the board, which, as you said, you don't meet with them very often. Uh, and then to come to find out there's a mix, a, a, not a match, you know, it's a mix, a mix match. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, very important to do the due diligence. And I, I like to stress to people, you don't want to take the first offer you have. You want to take the right offer because right. that is going to set a brand and a reputation for you. And it's going to color your experiences going forward. And we find many people, once they get that first uh, for-profit role, really get excited about it often and think, I would like to do more of such and yes, such. But yeah. It might be in a slight different direction of, of how you first started or you think about maybe I will take it on in a few years hence when I have a little bit more time because it is demanding. So clearly you were talking about a 14 hour commute for a board role. Right? Right. Um, but I would love to hear some of your experiences in living between a full time job already and the board on top of it. How you actually made that work because it is a much probably bigger expectation than a lot of people understand. Yeah. Um, well, it's just a, what, it, what it's like deciding what you're not going to do. Right. I mean, this is a discussion I have with my, my wife. Um, Um, when I contemplate doing something additional like another board membership. And I have actually um, turned some down because I knew I couldn't take that, those days out of a quarter, right, that I was going to be gone again uh, on top of my consulting travel I already had. And um, and then I couldn't commit the time to doing the reading that I needed to do, the preparation uh, and the research to be an active and, and, uh, you know, contributing board member. So, uh, 
it, it, it's just a matter of do I have the, the hours available? I mean, I remember the one I, I, last one I turned down was I actually did that. How many hours in a day do I have? How much is, would I expect to do? And how much time would I be taking away from family? And I had to say, you know, no, thank you. Um, interesting enough, the CEO did come back like three or four years later and ask me to to join again. Um, and this is another thing. And then, but then he ended up leaving. So I've had it happen a couple of times to me, be, you know, be careful while you join. It's not personality driven as well. Um, because you can join because you think the CEO is great and you might find out you're there three months or a quarter or two quarters and the CEO gone. So you get a new CEO, the board. So you need to be really, really careful. It's not about the personality driven, but it's about the organization and what the organization is trying to get done. Because that's a tough balancing act once you're in there, especially if you like the CEO, maybe they're your friend. Right. You've got all the shareholders that you're trying to work the benefit for, depending on the situation. Uh, there might be uh, employees, of course, uh, pensioners, all the, the community, all these sorts of different people that you're trying to balance. I always liken it to having all these voices on my shoulder that I'm trying mm. to do the right thing for right. all the time, uh, which is not easy. And, and a nonprofit often can take it to another level because you might have one or two key people that are really built it up and are essential to it in a way that an established business has a a lot more of uh, optionality behind right. it. Can you talk us through some of the experiences you've gone through in a nonprofit where it's it's been a bit surprising of, yeah, this is really different from the business world. I got to adjust how I go about it. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting. It's, it, was, um, it, it was almost as foreign as working in Japan if that makes sense, um, because the expectations around the nonprofit um, are very different um, than the expectations you have in, in business. Uh, and so, once again, the pace with which you think things might sh might move are not going to move that fast. Um, and the ability to make change is probably not going to be uh, what you'd like it to be either. Um, so, you know, from that perspective, it's, it can become very... Um, uh, kind of taxing almost because you know what you think needs to be done and so it gets back to the right questions understanding how you can influence through um, you know helping people understand uh, on management what uh, what could the possibilities are and what could be done and then also helping with the strategy formulation which I had talked about earlier I think is really really important helping them think through what could be and then and then um, helping them understand uh, how would you then be held accountable for what could be? So what metrics can you put in place? What are the KPIs? What are the things you as a board can measure and, and count that will help them understand if they're being successful and it makes it easier for you to govern as well? And you've talked on, on this show about I'm going to summarize it. There's a lot of work involved and not just the, the work of the reading for the pack. You talked about, you know, the reading you're going to need to do outside of it to stay topical and whatever it is. It might be something the company is going through or you think that's coming down the pike in the future. And hopefully that's an exciting thing, especially if it's in your area of expertise right. or the company's the industry that you're really fascinated by. Uh, the expectations on a board member are growing, especially think about the fiduciary challenges that are now upon all of us. The world is very different than it was 20 years ago. I imagine the future will, again, be very different uh, from having been in so many of these leading companies in different spaces, having sat in several board seats. Where do you envision uh, the role the board is going to look like as we go forward? That's an excellent question. Um, well, it's going to be... Uh more important from a risk perspective, right? And um, I think that's one of the things that uh, I was working with a consultant on a, a board governance document, and he, what he, what he said was surprising, was that um, the board members typically don't understand the risk that they actually have. Right? They have so much more risk than the CEO does, right? Um, and from a fiduciary responsibility. And I think that a lot of board members walk into those roles not truly understand what they're subjecting themselves to. Even though they, there's insurance to cover all that, it's, it's more than just financial. You well, yeah, exactly. You hope. Good point. But it's more than just financial risk. You know, there's, there's, there's the uh, personal risk as well, right? Your own brand risk. Um, so it is, um, I think, going to be more important that you are uh, really um, an expert in what you're supposed to be an expert in. Um, as you said, you really understand what's going on for that company in the market, um, and you understand the risks that are out there um, that the company should be thinking through, uh, and helping the leadership of that entity understand the risks and asking them how they're going to manage through those risks, right, uh, and protect against those. Because um, 
it, things are not getting less complicated, they're getting more complicated. <laughs> That's right. And the pace of change is only faster. Yeah. And I think you've touched on something really interesting here. Uh, maybe this helps us wrap a bow around it. So risk, an essential part of what a board member's job is. And yet, we know how hard it is just by seeing some of the scandals going on. And I think there are a lot of people look at it so that surely the board should have known that XYZ was happening. Well, let's realize that they're not immersed in the day to day as much as they are in the other businesses that they're running, right? And you probably have a conception of that. I have all this under control because I'm managing, but like, oh wait, no, I'm not actually managing on a regular right. basis. I don't have that information. I have to, as you said before, figure out how to ask the right questions to get the right information. You have to do work in between meetings. And yet still it's very challenging, which is why we compensate professional directors because it's not easy. Right? Right. Not everybody is prepared to do it. So when people think about how do I get prepared? How do I get ready? I'm planning at whatever period down the line, this is something I want to do. If you were stepping back earlier in your career, looking forward, going, I know I want some board roles someday. What would you say is the most important thing that people should be doing? Well, uh, the f- researching, right? Researching to understand, like, um, it's a nice thing to think about, but to really understand, you know, what is a board member actually do what's expected of them um what uh, what kinds of things can you do to prepare yourself um you know it's always, i've always found that uh, getting mentored by someone in that role is really really very very important so associating yourself with board members that are already there before you uh, and understanding what uh what what made them successful, what got them to where they are. And through that mentoring and, and networking, then it was a natural path for me um, to be able to to get to where I wanted to be in the first place. So it was all around finding the people that I could follow um, and then, you know, help, having them kind of pull me along after I demonstrated what they thought was the ability to, to actually do the job. And I think that's great advice. I'm sure that's true for many people here. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. There's lots of people we can learn from and right. go and develop with. There are amazing books out there. There are leading speakers and thinkers. And you don't have to do it alone, which is why we're delighted that you are a part of our audience and sharing, learning, and growing. And, and Craig, I appreciate you being uh, honest and open about your path and the way it works. It's fun hearing about some of your challenges. And we usually don't talk about this show on the ironic part of an American being the minority on another right. board somewhere else. Right. So it's great for us to think about that. But we are, we are all in some ways trying to figure out how we fit in our unique space into a board to add value and give back to it and we were grateful to have you on the show today and we appreciate you sharing all of your insights and helping our audience to be more boardroom bound That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Craig Hovda. It was wonderful to hear someone explain very simply how they started their career, got really good at it, which is what we're all supposed to do initially, and then in parallel with that, took an opportunity to be in the boardroom space, did it really well, learned from it, and leveraged that into the next opportunities. And I think that's a great lesson for many of us thinking in our audience, how do I get that first board seat? How do I take advantage of the opportunities? How do I then promote that and get into the next one? Now, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you will get links to everything that we talked about in today's episode. And please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound.